I want to start the show on a somber note. Yeah, the rumors, the rumors are true. I have been waived by the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Um, uh, my time there was was an honor. Uh, I really, really enjoyed living in in Orange County. Uh, I really liked the weather. Uh, I really enjoyed the the competence of the Angels franchise. But I understand being waived. Um, we'll see if I pass through waivers. Otherwise, uh, they're just going to release me to to free agency. So any any teams out there needing needing my talents, I'm available. I will give you my all for a September playoff push if you just put me on the roster. So I wanted to start the show off with that. I know everyone has been kind of talking about my fate um, with the with the Angels recently, uh, and I've been waived. I've been waived, unfortunately. But on that note, welcome back, everyone, to the Chaos Ball Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Listen, am I a baseball player? No. But... I'm on podcast waivers, officially. No, I'm just kidding. But the Angels, listen, I'm going to talk about the Angels. All right, I'm starting off the show hot. I, it's probably going to be a shorter show. Rob Manfred's got me running around doing a bunch of stuff to grow the game of baseball, so I don't have a bunch of time today to sit here and talk about how great the Seattle Mariners, the first place Seattle Mariners, still in first Seattle Mariners, are at baseball. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about the Mariners. Less, less Mariners than last week, but I'll, I'm going to talk about the Angels a little bit. Uh, the Angels, I, it came across my timeline the other day, like everyone's, on August 29th, that the Angels waved a few guys. I have Jeff Passon alerts on my Twitter. I don't know if any of you all have that as well. Probably not super healthy for me to have tweet alerts on for just Jeff Passon, particularly around the trade deadline. It was quite tough, but I needed it. I needed it. And I still have the, the alerts on. And I get this notification on my phone. And I thought it was a joke. I, I've i never, ever seen anything like this. And I think it was somewhat unprecedented. The Angels, as you probably know, the way of Lucas Giolito, Matt Moore, Reynaldo Lopez, Hunter Renfro, and Randall Grichuk, uh, all of the guys, except for Hunter Renfro, the, they had traded for at the deadline. Uh, all of them, at least. Hunter Renfro... Had been on the team all year. But the other four fellas, or no, Matt Moore and Hunter Renfro had been on the team. But Giolito, Reynaldo, and Grichuk were, were deadline additions. And Giolito and Reynaldo Lopez, obviously, uh, they got traded for the two and three prospects of the Angels system at the deadline. And they've been waived. And this all will save the Angels a couple million dollars at the end of the day. Really, it's not like the worst move ever because they're out of contention. They went for it, uh, and so why not You know, save a little luxury tax money, I guess? You don't need these guys. It kind of sucks for them. It's, it's good and bad for them, I guess, because uh, I get, like, I'll talk about where they went, but they're going to contenders, uh, theoretically contenders. They're not, you know, they're not going to the Dodgers or anything, but it's it's also just you, you just got there, you're a month in, to, to live in an Orange County, and then bam, no longer. I've never seen anything like this. I really can't believe the Angels did it. Like, I mean, waivers is generally, there's sometimes guys who are worth it on waivers post-trade deadline, but <laughs> never this many, like, actual guys who could impact a playoff roster significantly uh, who've gone on waivers this late in the year, and maybe this is the move now for teams. I think MLB might have to step in here and make a rule that you're you sh- you like can't place guys on waivers who you just traded for at the deadline because this is brutal, and this just kind of makes things. It's it definitely makes things spicier because the, of the waivers rules because you have to have a lower record to be higher on the waiver wire. But I don't know. I just can't believe this. I can't believe they've done this. And I feel like it's it's going to be a trend, especially with teams who are trying to get that third wild card spot. If anything happens like this to a team again, like the Angels, what's stopping them from just putting guys on waivers? I mean, it's like I think Passon or other people made this analogy. It's like in fantasy football when you miss the playoffs and you just drop all your best guys. It's like, come on. 
hold on to them, Angels, you, you cowards. If you're going to put guys on waivers, throw Mike Trout and Shohei Otani on waivers, huh? Why not? Do it. Do it. Do it, Perry Manassian, you coward. No, I, I, I just... All of these guys hitting waivers at once was absolute chaos. Interestingly, uh, the Cincinnati Reds claimed Hunter Renfro. They also claimed Harrison Bader. Uh, the Yankees placed Harrison Bader on waivers, but Renfro went to the Reds from the Angels, and then the Guardians claimed Matt Moore, Lucas Giolito, and Ronaldo Lopez, which I kind of love. The Guardians at that time were only five games back of the Twins. Obviously not shooting for the wild card. They're out of that, but they can still win that sad, sad, sad division called the AL Central. Uh, five games back of the Twins, and with a month left, and they have, I think, a three-game set this week against them. It's not out of the realm of possibility that the Guardians make the playoffs. It's an uphill battle. But also what it's what this does is prevents the Twins from also grabbing those guys who are higher on the waiver priority than the Guardians. So like, screw it. Why not? Matt Moore, legitimately fantastic reliever. Has been awesome this year. Was great last year. G. Lito, struggled, struggling this year a little bit. Still, I think, a viable pitcher uh, that the Guardians kind of need. Uh, they tried it with Syndergaard, didn't work. I think Gilito can probably be that. And then Ronaldo, just, you know, bullpen arm. Serviceable bullpen arm, for sure. I The Angels have completely thrown in the towel. I still think they made the right choice. I think going for it rather than trading Shohei was the move. Uh, it's obviously easy to say they shouldn't have done that now and they shouldn't have traded their farm, but trading their, quote, farm... Like, they're two and three prospects, again, like I said, at the trade deadline. They they weren't going to propel this team into relevancy in the next five years. Like, that didn't matter. Uh, it's just crazy to see them officially throw in the towel and just get rid of all these guys like this. It's just such a weird franchise. Who knows what happens from here? I just They're just the saddest franchise in baseball right now. And it's crazy that they have taken up that mantle in the public space. While the Oakland A's are literally um, being removed, forcefully removed from Oakland, uh, and they don't deserve that. But the story this year has been the Angels' incompetence. Just crazy shit. And there's an alternate universe where the Angels are in first place right now. They traded at the deadline for these guys, and instead of all being awful for them, literally all of these guys have been bad that they traded for, hilariously. Uh, there's an alternate universe where all those guys click they're in first, the Mariners are out of the playoff race. Like There is a universe where that is happening right now. I can guarantee you that. Uh, but it's not this one, and this is the one that matters uh, for our purposes for this podcast. So that I wanted to open the show with that because it's unprecedented. I've never seen this many quality dudes available to contending teams, and none of them really went to, like, I don't know, I bet the Rangers and the Astros would have liked a Matt Moore or even a Giolito. A lot of teams, like the Rays, probably would have picked up all three of those guys in a heartbeat. Uh, but no, the Reds get some guys, and the Guardians get some guys. And then the Mariners claim Dominic Leone, another Italian on the team. Uh, former Mariner, also Italian, briefly a Mariner. He's back. He's back on the team, and it's a bullpen arm. I have no other comments besides he's a Italian and a bullpen arm, and that is what he means to the team. But that is all I have to say on the Angels. No more Angels talk officially for the rest of the show. Now, is this this is Mariners related, but not to the big league squad. The Modesto Nuts. The Modesto Nuts, everyone. They've won 13 games in a row. They just won again today on a walk-off Grand Slam. They simply can't lose. The Miners are humming. And it's led by five of the best hitting prospects in the Mariners system right now. Obviously in Everett you have um you have Harry Ford and Cole Young and Gabriel Gonzalez up in Everett and those are also, you know, top ten hitting prospects in the system. But then you have these five dudes and it's early for a few of these fellas, all of these guys really, but it's led by these five guys who are some of the better bats in the system, and definitely they have been this year, and then the future is clearly, clearly bright. They've been leading this 13-game win streak, and they're just never going to lose again. There are three that I talked about last week, three prospects, uh, that even like casual Mariners fans probably know of uh, by now. Colt Emerson, Ty Pete, 
who I talked about, top two picks in the draft this year in the first round uh, with Cal Farmelo. And then Lazaro Montes, who I also talked about, who is getting the Jordan comps. And I won't talk about them on this show. I, If you're listening to this and didn't tune in last week, tune into last week's Hear me talk about those guys more in depth because they're very exciting, especially Lazaro Montes. Uh, the other two guys of the five who I'm speaking of on the Modesto Nuts are having fantastic seasons and are on the rise, but probably less known to the general public, the general Mariners fans, I guess, unless you're kind of like a sicko who's listening to this podcast and keeps up with the Mariners religiously, like like myself and many others. Brock Rodden, Rodden, I think it's Rodden, Rodden. R O D D E N Brock Roden and Luis Suisbell Suibel Suisbell genuinely don't know how to say these guys' names. Uh, but Roden is the fifth round pick this year in 2023. So if you follow the draft, you probably recognize the name. Uh, he's having a really good start to his professional career. Uh, he's been playing third base, DH, second base. Um, it's funny in the minors if you look at fielding, unless you're like a top, top, top prospect who's playing center field every day or shortstop every day if you're just kind of a like this guy type Brock Roden like second base third base DH probably corner outfield you play a lot in the minors a lot of roster churn down there really good start to his professional career wanted to shout him out he's one of the the impact bats on this Modesto Nuts lineup and I know he's been uh, leading off for them as well and then Luis Suisbell I, I, I don't think that's how you pronounce it but I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, he was an international signing a few years ago, having probably the consensus, like the breakout season of the minors, uh, Mariners minor leaguers this year. Absolutely, absolutely raking <laughs> down in A-ball this year. Uh, out of nowhere, too. I mean, you kind of have a guy like this every year. He's an international signing, but not like a high-profile one like like Julio was a fairly high profile international signing and like Felnan Celestin, who a lot of Mariners fans know as a prominent signing this year. But this guy signed, I want to say in 2019 and he uh, just has had an absolute breakout at the plate this year, been raking. He's been DHing and playing first. I know he can play second and again, minors. I think, I think first might be where he sticks. Uh, but he's been, mashing down there i will talk about him probably specifically on my minor league recap episode at the end of the year when i take my minor league team of the year and spoiler alert <clears throat> minor league breakout of the year probably this guy probably this guy uh, kind of came out of nowhere burst on the scene this year down there uh, but shout out to the desto nuts i want to talk about them a little bit because minor league baseball rules and they've won 13 in a row 13 in a row is crazy Especially just in the minors. I mean, it's so, I don't know, it's just so random down there in the minor leagues. But those five guys have been doing a lot of heavy lifting for this lineup. Um, literally today, they won on a Luis Seasbill Grand Slam walk-off, which is hype. Uh, that The lineup today was Brock Roden, Colt Emerson, Ty Pete, Lazaro Montez, and Luis Seasbill, one through five. So those are the guys leading the charge, really excited going into next year. Uh, I'm assuming all of those guys will probably touch uh, the Aqua Sox, potentially the Travs. I don't know, man. Maybe the Rainiers, maybe the big league club. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But those guys, absolutely raking. Shout out to the Nuts. Shout out to the Modesto Nuts. Now, I guess I'll talk. I guess I'll talk about Mariners baseball. I don't have... Too many specific topics to talk about on the M's this week. Like I said, I mean, they've won two of three against the A's. Uh, Julio was nervously scratched from the lineup and then missed a game after that as well for left foot soreness, which everyone was really concerned. Uh, and it turns out he is fine. So he's back in the lineup. Uh, they, they take two of three from the A's in what felt like a series that was a month ago, but it was earlier this week and then they just lost two of three to the Mets in New York pretty frustrating loss losses actually lost two to one on Friday and six to three today uh, the first time they've lost by more than two runs since I think July um, fifth no not 15th 
19th, yeah, against the Twins. They lost 6-3 that game. And since then, they've lost by two or less, which <laughs> tells you how hot this team has been. Like, God, I talked about them at nauseum, how hot they've been last week. But that's that's pretty freaking crazy. That's why their run differential has stayed above a hundo and been steadily rising because they're not get, really getting blown out like they had been a couple a couple times earlier in the season. But I don't know, the Mets series felt weird. You had your horses going. You had your three three horses of the bullpen, out, or not the bullpen, Jesus, uh, the starting rotation going. You had Castillo, Gilbert, and Kirby, one, two, three, uh, and you lose <laughs> You lose two of those starts. You win the Logan Gilbert one in an 8-7 to seven matchup. A lot of home runs in this series. I don't know. I didn't watch all this series. I've been somewhat busy living my life this weekend, but I watched some portions of most of these games. Uh, I did get to see a little bit of the the Gilbert start. Kodai Senga, amazing. Been awesome to watch him this year. And Logan Gilbert was fantastic in that start. Got out-dueled, but still just because Senga was phenomenal. And then Andres Munoz gave up gave up a run late in that game. Oh, I'm talking about Friday. Sorry, I'm all over the place. Friday is the, was the Logan Gilbert, and then Castillo was Saturday. Give up some runs, but you lose that start from Gilbert. Sucks. Sango was so good. It's like, well, we can chalk it up to that's fine. Cody Sango is an ace. He is a scion candidate for the National League. He has been amazing. Uh, if you watched him that game and and thought that was more lineup troubles rather than Cody Sango being phenomenal, I don't know what to tell you. Because uh, then you go into the next game, Luis Castillo's on the bump, and he gives up five runs, but you, you leg that one out. You win 8-7. You win 8-7 in a quite a dramatic, dramatic game. Uh, I don't know what it is about playing in New York, but some timely home runs from Dominic Canzone in the sixth inning, and then J.P. Crawford... Leads off the ninth inning with a donger. I'm going to talk about J.P. Crawford a little bit in a second. But you get the win against the Mets, and it's like, well, okay, we got we got our man on Sunday. We got George Kirby going on Sunday. And I'll be honest with you. I watched the first inning of this game today, and then, again, I went out to do stuff with my girlfriend and my dog because I can't just watch baseball all weekend. Although I wish I could. Kirby goes three innings, gives up three runs, some hits, some Ks. Not not the sharpest from Curb. And then the bullpen just gives up some runs steadily, and, and they can't really string anything together after uh, they go, the Mets go to their bullpen. And you lose 6-3, to three, just deflating. Just a deflating series. Because going into it, it's your, it's your three best starters. That is the playoff lineup. That is games one through three of a wild card slash divisional series. Uh, you probably not Gilbert one, but you could entertain any of these guys for one at this point in the year. I imagine they'll go with Luis Castillo by virtue of he is technically quote the ace. Although, you know, Kirby has, I said at the all-star break, been the better pitcher this year, but you start Kirby, Gilbert, or Castillo first in the playoff series, I'm chilling with that. Those are the three guys. doesn't matter the order. And you lose to the Mets, who have been just bad this year. And uh, luckily, the Rangers and the Astros and even the Blue Jays haven't been on fire. So you, the Mariners are still in first, thankfully, uh, hanging on by a thread. It feels they're only a half game up with the Strohs right now. And then one game ahead of the Rangers and everything is shaping up for chaos at the end of the year. Everything is shaping up for the last eight games being against the Rangers and the Astros uh, to be as dramatic as possible. Like that is going to decide the year. I, I'm assuming the Blue Jays will hang around, but that will decide the wild card order to an extent as well. Like that's pivotal to the entire seating of the American League, essentially. And it's building up to that, and I'm scared. I'm very scared. It's three weeks, and then we get that. I'm fr- I'm legitimately frightened about what's going to happen because I want to win the fucking division. I want the division. I'm greedy now. Now that we've had a taste of first, I never want to give it up. But that was what they did this week. 
I I don't want to focus on anything specific from this game, these games. I mean, again, week to week, I don't want to be too nitty gritty. One thing though, yesterday, it's eight to seven. It's Saturday. JP Crawford hits the the home run in the ninth to put the Mariners up one run. Bottom of the ninth, Daniel Vogelbach hits a gapper for the Mets and and tries to leg out a double. Down one in the bottom of the ninth. It gets thrown out. Least surprising thing to ever happen. Daniel Vogelbach gets thrown out stretching a single into a double. Of course he got thrown out. And J.P. Crawford just was like looking at him shocked and just chuckling. Like, what? Like, come on, dog. What are you doing? Why are you trying to stretch that into a, into a double? I get, like, your team's down one. Imagine if he made it. But he wasn't even close. The ball got to J.P., the cutoff man, and J.P. even scuffled a little bit. He didn't throw it as quick as he could have, and he still got Vogue out by a foot or two. I wanted to mention that specifically from the game because that's hilarious. And the the gif of J.P. Crawford afterwards is, is very funny as well. But just, I, I don't know, uninspiring, uninspiring ball today specifically um but not gonna dwell on it we move to next week uh specifically because the main guys are still kind of producing um and so that's really important tay oscar has been hitting really well jp as well uh and julio is you know still julio but jp crawford i want to talk about jp crawford a little bit jp crawford is awesome but he also has 14 home runs this year. 14! I guarantee I didn't predict that in my pregame series. His home run tallies since he made his debut in 2017 read, and this is yearly, 0, 3, 7, 2, 9, his career high in 2021, last year, 6, and this year, 14! 14 dingers! His isolated power this year is 165. It was .093 last year and .103 the year before that when he hit his career high nine home runs. Monster year. Monster, monster year has been the best shortstop. mm, Okay. The best qualified shortstop in the American League. I'll say that with confidence because Corey Seager's not qualified yet. He's been the best, but not qualified. Not going to count it. Uh, He has 3.7 F war. 137 WRC plus from JP Crawford is phenomenal. Has raised his walk rate to 15.4% along with his K rate to 19.3, which is pretty high for him as it's sat between 13 and 16 since he got to Seattle after 2019. Uh, But the walk rate is raised and the K rate is raised a little bit. That's still pretty well under league average. Uh, and the K rate has risen because he's hitting for more power. He's just simply hitting for more power. There's a great Fanagraphs article I linked to uh, on Twitter when it came out a couple days ago about kind of what he's done. It's just kind of, it's just changed his swing, and he just has more power to the pull side now. He's still a really good contact hitter, but now he is more selective on pitches in the middle of the plate, and he hunts fastballs in the middle of the plate, and he's been destroying them this year. And the best part about it is he's so selective that even if you throw him a breaking ball, if you get a guy who's hunting fastball, obviously you're what you're trying to do is get him to swing and miss or roll over on something, hit something weakly. And so you throw him breaking balls. You can't really do that to J.P. Crawford because, one, if you drop a breaking ball in the zone, if it catches enough of the zone he's going to hit it pretty hard like most major league hitters. It's still a pitch in the zone. Breaking balls are at their most effective thrown out of the zone. But if you throw a breaking ball out of the zone, J.P. Crawford's not going to swing at it because he's so selective and his eye is so good. He's just not going to swing. And so he's just not going to swing, not going to swing until he gets a fastball in the middle of the zone and he hits that really hard. Uh, Just been awesome this year. Has been an absolute joy. Uh, The defensive metrics... Still don't like him. They still really don't like him. But he's nice to watch play shortstop. He's an eye test guy. 
He's an all-time eye test shortstop because the metrics just really don't like the guy. Uh, but I like him. So that's what counts. But he's been so good at the plate, and he went to driveline this offseason. Driveline said, hey, here's what you're going to do with your swing. And there's very visible changes, and look what's happened. Career year, by far. Career year. Walking more. Hitting more dingers. Just been an anchor at the top of the lineup. Like, we, I don't know where the Mariners would be without J.P. Crawford, but it's it's been just amazing to watch. And on the topic of driveline, I'm wondering, like, what is stopping the Seattle Mariners from sending their entire team to driveline in the offseason? Pitchers, mm, you don't need to send them. Clearly, they're doing something right with pitchers. And they're doing decent things with hitters, too. But what if they just said, hey, guys, we're all going to take a field trip. They all pile on a school bus, and they drive down to Kent, I believe, is where the driveline is. And they all just get coached. Because it has worked for J.P., it's worked for a lot of hitters. I understand that a lot of big league hitters don't actually want to do something like that. JP seems like a, a guy who is, is more inclined to go driveline himself. Like maybe he was, you know, encouraged by the team or his agent or whatever. But I know there's some guys and a lot of guys in the bigs who just do their job. They hit. They don't get much into the nitty-gritty, nerdy stuff of a swing. They just know what their swing is, and they don't want to get into the driveline, like, you know, <laughs> saber metrics, statistics, I should say. But what is stopping the Seattle Mariners from sending their whole lineup there? Is there, like, a competitive balance sort of thing that would allow them not to do that? Like, what would be the drawback of doing that? Imagine they do that, and they and they come out swinging, like, the 19... 19- 20s Yankees or or the Braves this season like they could be the most formidable lineup in the league imagine that I have no answer that's a purely that's a question for the ether I don't know the answer and they should just send the entire lineup there why not why not send the entire lineup there Uh, but before I talk about some other stuff in the broader MLB because I'm I don't want to focus on that much Mariners baseball this week as I said. Teoscar Hernandez has been raking, however, I would like to say that. Teoscar Hernandez had an absolute freaking month of August. He played 25 uh 26 games. He had 25 starts, 26 games, slashed 365, 396, 654 slugging. That's a 1050 OPS. And that is a slugging percentage that is just a hair underneath 400 points higher than his July slugging. His July OPS was 534. And he's raised that to, he raised it in August to 1050 in the month of August. Absolutely insanity. And he has not slowed down yet. He has had, not including today, he had two games, obviously, in September, September 1st and September 2nd. And he went three, four, eight with one home run, three RBIs, uh, a few hits. Just been seeing it really well. Has been absolutely swinging a hot bat since August began, and it's been amazing. It's been awesome to watch. This has been the Teoscar as advertised, and I tweeted something along the lines of when we like look back on this season, like at the end of the year, if I go back to Teoscar and I look at his numbers they're gonna look you know by the end of the year they might still look a little bit lower than his his past like three to four years but i think if he keeps hitting like this they're gonna look pretty damn similar and boy is it not gonna feel that way at all it has been a topsy-turvy year but it's really good to see him hitting well at at a time like this and it's it's a tough it's a tough fan experience Teoscar Hernandez. I, I tweeted this as well a while ago. The Teoscar experience at the plate is every at bat looks pretty shitty until he hits the ball really hard. He's still really good at hitting the ball hard, but his at bats are pretty garbage. So I understand, especially when he was underperforming, it can be wildly frustrating when he's underperforming because the at bats are just terrible. But he's cut down on the strikeout rate and his at bats are. are no, 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 no. Yes, it's one of those. It's like, listen, you just got to wait till he hits the ball really hard. 
And that has been awesome. Could be absolutely huge in the playoffs. I mean, he if he can anchor that that lineup from a power perspective in the four spot, that'd be real helpful considering uh, Eugenio Suarez hasn't really been able to do that. That was my slick transition into talking about uh, Eugenio has been struggling. He has he's been struggling recently. The he's actually been pretty consistent the whole year. He had a slow start like everyone else, and then July is is when he picked it up like the whole team. But recently, like the past week or two, he's been slowing down. In the past fourteen days, he has a seven ninety five OPS. That's still a little bit above league average. But past seven days, he has a five oh nine OPS. And I'm I'm calling this out because one, still a very small sample. Obviously, it's it's you know he's a power hitter too. He can have a week where he slugs seven hundred. He can have a week where he slugs two hundred. That's how it goes sometimes. But his his plate appearances have just been particularly uh, awful recently. Uh, I just wanted to bring it up because he's going to win a gold glove at third base. He just needs to provide a little bit more power right now. He's got 18 home runs uh, on the year. If he if he has a decent last couple of weeks and then hits some dingers in the playoffs, you know we're fine with that. Uh, I'm just I'm a little worried. He's he's been so consistent for pff, seven years now. Is is since 2017 his home run tallies: 26 home runs, 34 home runs. 49 home runs in that 2019 year of juice balls. That was wonderful for everyone. Uh, 2020 shortened season. He had 15 home runs in 57 games. Uh, 2021, he had 31. Comes to Seattle. Hits 31 again. And leads the league in strikeouts, but hits 31 home runs. And then this year, he's at 18. And and leads the league in strikeouts. Like we're okay with leading the league in strikeouts if you're hitting thirty bombs, but I, I'm I'm not pressing the panic button, especially because his defense has been sublime. It's been amazing to watch him play defense this year, and that has been a, an absolute joy. Especially last year, he was great too. But I, his isolated power is down seventy points from his his as average the past couple of years this year. I'm a little worried. I'm not pressing the panic button, but I'm a little worried about the future of Eugenio Suarez uh, as a power hitter. I I hope he can put it together next few weeks. I just want to talk about it a little bit. And then before I move on from those two guys, I don't know what's happening with the nicknames on Baseball Reference. Uh, I don't know who sources these. It's true with Basketball Reference, too, because one of... I particularly like looking at basketball players' nicknames because it's hilarious. Like, one of LeBron James's nicknames on Basketball Reference is the Little Emperor, which is amazing. And the Akron Hammer, I think, is one of them. Who calls him that? No one. Literally no one. But Teoscar Hernandez has two nicknames in here, which, where do they get these? One of them is Oka, which I don't know the origins of that. And the other one is Mr. Seeds which he does like to throw seeds at you after you hit a home run. So I see where that's coming from, but who calls him that? Me. The answer's me. I will be calling to Oscar Hernandez Mr. Seeds from now on. It's official. And then Eugenio Suarez. What are his nicknames? Oh, you might say Gino. Nope, that is not listed on here. His nicknames are Nicole. Yep, you heard me right. Nicole. N-I-C-O. L L E Nicole with two L's is one of his nicknames. Why? No idea. The other nickname for him, which we should absolutely start calling him this, is Bali Bamba Suarez. Bali Bamba Suarez, as everyone likes to call him. How is Gino not on here as a nickname? I don't understand. I want to dig into more about these nicknames because I'm fascinated about where they get them from, but I'm done talking about those two guys and I'm done talking about the Mariners. That's a wrap on the Mariners content for this week. Besides looking at the playoff odds right at the end of the show, as I like to do, but before I get out of here and no baseball reference player of the week, I have a good one for next week. I'm not going to include it in this show, but I have a pretty, pretty fun one for next week. 
But right now, just a couple a couple quick hitters. What's going on in the league as I wrap this short pot up? Colton Wong. He's not on the Mariners, so this doesn't count as a Mariners topic. First at bat with the Dodgers. Hits a home run. Socks it. Absolutely dicked on it. I think he was down with their uh, complex league team for a few days or like a week and came up first at bat. Dinger. Most predictable thing ever that he did that. Uh, Moving on. Ronald Acuna. 30-60 season for Ronald. A man who might not even win the NL MVP this year, yet he might have like a 35-70 year. I mean, if he goes on a tear, it could be 40-70. 40-80, even. 30-60, he's the first one to ever do it, is preposterous. I think there have been 20-60 seasons, maybe even 20-70, but no 30-60, and that's preposterous, and I wanted to mention it here because Ronald Acuna is amazing. Uh, just uh, awesome to watch. And 30-60 is almost unfathomable. So, shout out to Ronald Acuna. That is insane. 30-60 season. And I I might vote for Mookie for MVP if the season ended right now, but we'll have that conversation when the time comes. And then the other thing I want to talk about in the broader baseball world is the NL wildcard race is popping right now. The NL wildcard race is on drugs. The AL wildcard race, for reference, Tampa is six games ahead of the Astros, or six games ahead of the Rangers in the third spot right now. The Astros are half a game ahead of the Rangers in the third spot. And then the Toronto Blue Jays, who are on the outside looking in, are two games back of the Rangers, and then Boston is five and a half back, the Yankees are nine, and then the other teams are, you know, 10, 12, 13 and a half... (laughs) Whatever. Oakland and Kansas City have been officially eliminated from playoff contention. The NL wildcard is bonkers. The Phillies are five games ahead of the third place Diamondbacks right now. It's looking like the Phillies, it's not a lock, but they might be a wildcard team. They're looking like a pretty solid team right now, and they're not going to win their division because the Braves exist. The Chicago Cubs are two and a half games ahead of the Diamondbacks in third place. And then after the Diamondbacks in third, you have the Marlins, the Giants, and the Reds all tied at a half game back of the Diamondbacks for the third wildcard spot. We could conceivably see a four-game tie for the third wildcard spot. And what does that mean? I have no idea what that means. I The tiebreakers, I know, the fir- I know it's like head-to-head, but I don't know how that works out for four like a four-way tie. I want maximum chaos, and so I want... I'm just going to assume the Phillies are going to get this first wildcard spot. I want a five-way tie for second and third in the wildcard spot. I want a five-game tie. That would be amazing. But now, a scenario with a four-game tie. The Cubs and the Phillies are in. They're the one and two in the wild card. And then you've got the Diamondbacks, the Marlins, the Giants, and the Reds, all tied for third place. And you could say, hey, there's tiebreakers for this. Or you could make up your own special tiebreaker. I'm talking to you directly, Mr. Manfred. Hello. Have each team choose a champion and have a home run derby. Whoever wins gets the wild card spot. Tell me you wouldn't watch that. Tell me you wouldn't tune into that. I... That would be that would be so much fun. It would be amazing. And I just want it to happen now. Home run breaker tiebreakers should be a thing. Um, they should utilize that unique aspect of baseball, the home run. Uh, they should use that more often, like in a tiebreaker scenario. You might say, that's not fair. That's the most fair thing I can think of. You send your best guy to go out and hit dingers for you, and if he doesn't hit enough dingers, you don't make the playoffs? Come on. That's as pure as baseball can get. I don't know what else to tell you. But that's the NL wild card. I'm just excited. I'm just excited to see what happens. Uh, um, because the NL wild card is, is much less interesting now that like the Red Sox and Yankees and, and Angels and Guardians aren't really competing for it. But that that is it. I'm at the end of my rope. Fangrass playoff odds. Let's look at them. 
the weekly tradition that's wildly unhealthy for my mental my mental health. The Mariners are at 36.6 to win the division. They are at 50% to clinch the wild card, and they're sitting at a nice 86.6% to make the playoffs. I'm a big fan of that. The Astros, unfortunately, who are a half game back of your Seattle Mariners right now, sit at 47.2% chance to win the division with a 12.7% chance to win the World Series. The Mariners are at 69 It's almost half. The Braves are almost at 29% to win the World Series, which is, God, they're just so good. But the the fan graphs, the zips, likes the Astros a lot more down the stretch to win this division than the Mariners and the Rangers. Uh, likes the Rangers the least out of all three of these, but it is telling me that the Astros are the most likely by a decent margin, honestly, to win this division when it's all said and done with like almost 92 projected wins and the Mariners are at like 90. Part of it is strength of schedule. Unfortunately, the Mariners had a fairly easy month. That being said, they still played scorching baseball and were the best team in baseball this month. That be- They still didn't play amazing teams, and now they have a harder schedule. The Astros' strength of schedule now... I'm saying this on September 3rd, looking at fan graphs, is 491 is the remaining teams, the winning percentage of their strength of schedule. So, not great. The Mariners' remaining strength of schedule, 514. So, fairly large gap there, and you can obviously see it in uh, if you just look at the schedule. Like, these teams are good. They're playing the Reds. That is an NL wildcard contender. And they play them on the road next week. Then they play the Rays on the road right after that. The Rays are might win the AL East and are first in the wild card. And the Mariners play the Angels at home. And that's always kind of a shit show. Then they play the Dodgers. The Dodgers are decent. They're a fine, they're an okay baseball team. Then they play the A's. That's a brief respite before, again, like I talked about earlier, Rangers, Astros, Rangers to end the year. That is a gauntlet. That is a gauntlet schedule. And I, again, like I said earlier, I'm scared. I'm I'm frightened for what's going to happen in this in this last month because of the schedule. It's kind of sinister. Whoever made this freaking September schedule should be tried at the Hague is all I'm saying. But I'm wrapping it up here. I'm calling it. I appreciate everyone listening to my ramblings. If you're new and listen this far, at me on Twitter. I'll give you a big smooch through my phone. If you're a recurring listener, I love you. Plain and simple. I love you. But thanks for listening. Uh, I will have a pod next week after they play the Reds and the Rays. We'll see what happens there. It's a tough road trip after going to New York and dropping two or three, but we'll see what our Mariners can do. The most important thing is they still sit in the top of the division and they still have players who are good at baseball. So that definitely helps. But I appreciate y'all listening. Have a good rest of your week. And of course, go Mariners.